Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. This week we're gonna go into another small cat Canadian play. Um, this is one that's in the tech side as well, so it's a little obscure for most people. I doubt people have heard of it. It's actually on the Venture. I do own this one. It's part of what I've kind of compiled as a little software, uh, accelerated computing, and the AI as well, as it relates to cloud. So this is a fun one. I, I own Inquisitive and I also, I think I've already told you guys that I own Google and Meta and Amazon. Those of Amazon and Google especially have uh, the, the cloud infrastructure background. And then there's other software plays on top of that, like say for Cloudflare for security, I've been in and out of that one a few times. And Twilio, I think I've talked about whenever I went into an Amplitude, they're both on the software side, which are all interesting plays. But today's video is going to be on Inquisitive. But before I jump, hopefully this is big enough for you guys, but and this is kind of how I view and why I actually stumbled on this company, is basically right now, based on latest information, it looks like NVIDIA is kind of, they're doing well with uplift to accelerated computing. Um, specifically from the generative AI point of view, they uh, seem to have taken share from the old, um, older generic processing units. And we've seen um, the capital spending shift going to accelerated computing. So... Uh, we did see NVIDIA sales spike. We'll talk about that real quick too, um, because it flows into the infrastructure quarterback. So you have like the picks and shovels, which are the actual manufacturers of the product. Then you have the users of the product, the first tier, and you have those users of the product, the, the second tier. And so I think the markets, I'd argue, has figured out that both NVIDIA as well as infrastructure quarterbacks, like the cloud guys, like Google and Amazon and Microsoft, are all going to be relative winners here. Basically, the people who can afford <laughs> to quarterback the, the next push into computer or accelerated computing. But what we don't really know, and what's less clear, and even this one, this example, of course, it's this example is just something I want. It's not a full position yet. It's just something I'm starting to follow. We don't really know what it means for the software side. And so well, well, we, we have general ideas, like we know data security is going to be even more important. Data annex, analytics is probably an easy place for software to win here. And with accelerated computing, like not on this list, it could be like automated self-driving. On this list is easier computing, uh, more energy efficient, right? And then you have existing product improvements, which are a little bit easier for me to like visualize. So you have your Google advertising, your Microsoft Copilot, and data analytics, you have your Google analytics, Amplitude, Twilio, stuff like that. And security, like Net, Cloudflare, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. And there's a whole bunch though. So it's very hard to know who's actually going to be kind of the, day the big winner. Maybe they all slowly win. It's just um, what I'm trying to say here. It's more obvious who the, the infrastructure setup is than who's actually going to um, build the things that ride on the infrastructure that uh, currently Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are building out as we speak. One of the things how I found Quisitive was um, I was trying to think of who's a uh, win off of the ones that I know are winning in the infrastructure side, right? So Google and Microsoft and Amazon, really. So I'm like, who, who do I know? Who could I find that has some partnership that I could play off of with this? Inquisitive showed up under the Microsoft tie-in. So that's why we're doing this video today. Just so you don't know, I'm just like making stuff up about how great NVIDIA's quarter was. It was pretty crazy. You did have 140% quarter over quarter revenue jump. So just imagine making 140% more in one quarter. Pretty impressive. And that is the step change. And he claims it's a swing from um, CapEx spending on the big cloud guys going from general purpose to accelerated computing, which uh, NVIDIA currently has an advantage in relative to the other manufacturers you know, through them, TSMC, but TSMC also has the also provides the things that are currently um, lagging or suffering, which is you know, your generic, generic cloud. They manufacture everything. <laughs> but you can see this effect here on the data center server side, specifically as it relates to the cloud infrastructure for accelerated computing. And here's uh, from Intel's call in July, and they basically said the same thing. Like they're seeing the shift, like they're seeing softer on the CPU inventory side for servers because the near-term wallet share focus is going to AI accelerators rather than general purpose. That's what they said at the end of July. And then NVIDIA echoed that on their call. They said data centers are making a platform shift from GPUs to accelerated computing. Let's jump into it. Inquisitive is a fun one. Super small, only 187 million in revenue. It does have positive EBITDA, but it's not yet profitable. And one of the reasons for that is because they make a lot of acquisitions and then they have to amortize the intangibles over time. So you have this big uh, amortization expense, which hurts net income, but doesn't hurt cash flow. We'll go into the financials in a bit, but it's kind of how it plays out. It does have its headquarters in Dallas. It actually has most of its business generated in the U.S. As far as the business goes, there's two business segments, um, cloud solutions. 
and payment solutions. So this is a hard one to visualize. Again, tech is always a difficult one to show. <laughs> So bear with me, I'll try to explain this as best I can. Cloud solutions, I mean, they even have the vague eye bar, <laughs> the cloud with the, uh, the light bulb. Anyway, what uh, cloud solutions means is basically, this is an exclusive Microsoft. So all they do is with Microsoft. And so anyway, what they do is they take the Microsoft platform and they basically help the mid-size enterprise customers get onto the cloud for Microsoft. And they also um, allow them to let them operate within once they're there. That's within Azure, Microsoft 365, as well as Dynamics 365, or what they say they're three Microsoft clouds. That's kind of the gist of it. I mean, it's always hard to know how they sit in the competitive stack. They did say, I think when I was reading that they do have a designation with Microsoft as the national service integrator, which means they're one of the top 0.1% partners worldwide, but there's so many partners for this. So it's hard to know what was the typical advantages over time, which is the biggest weakness for this investment at this time. What else is, I think, yeah, to just try to sum it up as best I can, it's really just their primary business is helping enterprises move their operations to the cloud and then continue to support those enterprises as they operate and innovate within the cloud infrastructure. So yeah, I think that's probably the easiest way to uh, say what they do. And that this is the bulk of their business. This is the primary segment. And then they also have, here they have the payment solution segment. And this segment they acquired and they've built off of since then. We're not going to really go into PayIQ too much, but for our purposes, PayIQ is really, um, here we can read it here, intelligent solution captures, it analyzes the data, makes it anonymous, and then it enables an insight for personalized promotions. So you can see what they're trying to do here with PayIQ. They also make money on this, the processing volume, one of the middlemen in between. So obviously an agreement between the card and the uh, merchant who's actually selling stuff. So this is their second business. Uh, this one's smaller, but it is growing still. It's growing quite well. Or it has been. Um, I think on the call they mentioned they have Amex and uh, Discovery lined up as well for future partners. Right now they have Visa and MasterCard, I believe. It should further help them and what they can do with this over time. How the business looks. So historically speaking, this business looks pretty good. You can see annual revenue go from 13 million to 187 million in five years. So it's very it's very high growth. Part of this you could argue. Well, part of this is acquisitions, but a part of it could also be viewed from cloud. Because we know COVID um, accelerated people into the cloud quicker. That'd be why it's me reverting now a bit. We'll talk about the current quarter. It's a totally different trend than this one right now. Um, it's also a reason why the share price has already been cut in half. Uh, more than cut in half at this point. Anyway, it does have a, like I tried to say, it does have a history of positive EBITDA, which is important for the cash flow. Um, but it doesn't have profitable operations yet. So it's still early and it's on the venture for a reason and it's a penny stock for a reason. What's happening, which is, this is probably one of the more interesting slides for me, is that the bigger they're getting, they're also getting more reoccurring revenue. That's also a higher margin revenue. And it's also steadier your income, like every year, you can get it coming back in. Um, so it's more dependable revenue. I like seeing this over time, especially as the shift hopefully continues, as more and more of the revenue becomes reoccurring. Um, that's exciting to me over time, especially when your revenue growth rate is like this. Now, it's not like that now, which is why we're going to jump into the numbers in a second. This is an example of what they're trying to do with Copilot. So that's one of the Microsoft AI initiatives that they're doing. And as an exclusive partner, one of the better partners with Microsoft, they're also able to help people navigate the new offerings that Microsoft is going to push out. Because Microsoft is going to push Copilot very hard into all their product offerings, given the uh, extra dollar value they can extract per person. <laughs> Or per company, if they do enlist to go uh, the co-pilot route and get more out of their Word and Excel and PowerPoint and all that, with all that jazz, it's kind of where I'm thinking where an investment is going, right? Here's the annual, and you can see the the revenue growth rate pretty high, right? 18 million, 2019, 137, well, 187 with the uh, payment acquisition and build off of. I mean, this company that has made a lot of acquisitions, it's not organic growth, and that will show up on the balance sheet. As we go down, but you can see over time, the gross margin dollar has been improving dramatically. Um, the share price was reflecting this improvement until recently because it stopped improving. So we're going to go into the highest quarter in a second. But you can just see um, a couple of things with so the revenue is growing. So the GNA, um, when you're buying companies, you have to buy them, you incur all their costs, and you have to slowly um, extract the synergies out of them. I don't like when GNA expenses outpacing revenue growth. So they're trying to rectify that now on the latest quarter. And we'll see if they can. Another thing to point out here, which is more unique for the company, is the amortization is very high, 17 million bucks. And that sounds very high, but when your revenue is only 
187 million, you're almost like 10% of this amortization. If I were to add the depreciation there, you're, uh, <laughs> you're almost at $20 million, which is more than 10%, which is pretty uh, interesting. So that's one of the reasons why you see negative net income here, but you see positive cash flow from operations here and free cash flow as well. And the company itself is CapEx light because it's service orientated, really almost like a consultant point of view. We get people that they bring in to help um, you go onto the cloud, the Microsoft cloud, and then maintain and improve and improve insights while you're on the cloud. Um, you can see the share price used to be 24 cents and it went up to a buck and actually more than that. Um, actually went from $21 million valuation to $308 million valuation. So quite the spike. And then it's come back down. Um, the whole time, uh, where the cash for the acquisitions is coming from, it's coming from the um, the share count. So you can see they've been diluting to make the acquisitions. They did make some of the acquisitions near when this share price was much higher. So obviously it hurt the shareholders at that time who were in this company, but now looking at it, it looks good um, because they made these acquisitions and the share price is more expensive. Anyway, what else is there? Balance oh, sheet has a little bit of cash, but you can see it does have 76 million in debt. It's not great, but not bad. They are slowly paying this down over time. Um, it is with BMO, so I like to see them either get their EBITDA debt or their debt down, or the EBITDA up or their debt down. In terms of the metrics, however, it looks pretty good on the annual. You can see the EBITDA is just sliced steadily gone up every year until this year. <laughs> and uh, you can see it going from 8, 14, 29. That's pretty impressive, right? If I were to actually assume that they do 29 based on the current price, they're only at six times EBITDA, EBITDA for a company that's literally went from 18 million to 187 million. So 10x revenue in four years. I'm getting the EBITDA that's that cheap for something that's software related, <laughs> but, which is pretty interesting. So in terms of the valuation, it's always hard to judge these things because it's software, but it screens as one of the cheapest software companies that's around. It's linked to software anyway. Obviously, it's not a pure play. It's a consultant play on Microsoft software. <laughs> so there is a derivative. That's the reason why it would be cheaper. But it is interesting nonetheless. On the quarterly, you can see a change here. So you can see revenue cloud actually decrease year over year. Now, that they claim that projects are being delayed and some are pushed into Q3 2023. And I think that's probably true because we've heard that from a lot of software names so far. So a lot of people that were planning to put to cash to work have not. What else is there? Payments is still growing due to all the Visa, MasterCard, transaction improvements. But you can see the GM day shoot down with a limited response in sales and marketing and GNA. Now they have recently cut, but that was during the quarter. So we should see this improve in the next quarter, even if the revenue growth doesn't improve and stays a, in a decline actually. So here's the biggest thing is if you think this is gonna reaccelerate or not, that would be kind of the crux of this investment, as well as a couple other things we're gonna talk about on the call that was more interesting than what the current performance is. It's always hard to judge um, what this company could become on backwards looking information. Um, I already talked about the balance sheet, still not great. They have been starting to pay it down because they are generating some cash flow. This is on six months, but again, it's only, if I had to run right that, it's only $10 million. Um, so not great at all. And they have earnouts that we have to talk about as well. Only one left, but it's the last one. It's $10 million. So. Anyway, we've already talked about the company's been cut in half, actually more on an annual basis if we go back. We're getting something about 70% off. Technically, it's doubled from that year to over year in terms of EBITDA, um, even though now it's flat. So you can see now it makes more sense. So the market was obviously front running a decline. You could argue that it's overcompensated based on how it's historically traded. I mean, we're back to $115 million valuation to say the EV is 183, so we're barely back down to 2020 levels, but the business is about three times better than 2020 levels, three and a half times better. So we are getting a better price relative to itself here, but you never know how cheap these things can get when growth slows. But this isn't really a value play. It's more of how we project the future and how this partnership with Microsoft will work into the co-pilot AI environment, which is what I'm hoping they can do and what the market probably is unsure of. So anyway, we can see the share price got spanked, and that's why I started looking at it. I started acquiring in here. I think my average is right around where it is now, 32. Yeah, 33.2. So anyway, so I'm starting to acquire as it goes cheaper. I don't know if it'll be as cheap as it was back in when we barely had any business at all. But uh, <laughs> um, that would be nicer even, right? Then it could be a potential to be like a nice 10x. But, but who knows? It is a riskier profile company. 
here's the call notes, which is pretty interesting. So here they say the second quarter experienced a continued the prior growth trend with uh, cloud solutions deals postponed until the second half of 2023. Um, these deferrals were predominantly in the professional services offerings, especially in application development. So again, a lot of projects are being pushed out. And the same, there's various factors, but increased customer cautions, part of market trends. They're seeing some uh, hesitation to pull the trigger on some projects. This is an interesting one on the Microsoft. So they commenced in just July that they devoted a focus on AI-centric engagements with customers. It's now AI essential in all discussions. They claim we've already launched six AI-focused offerings catering to all stages of the customer journey. And they tell them kind of how, with this space, trying to tell investors how they're using the AI push out that Microsoft's doing. They've already started doing this with McKenzie Care, one of the acquisitions they made. Copilot, I kind of showed that screen real quick, but they uh, they are already starting to ride on this AI Azure push indirectly, and that's what I want to see. But we haven't seen results yet, sure. So this is just talking as far as I'm concerned. So we need to see results at some point. Right now, they're not any, so the market's skeptical. Uh, according to them, they claim that these uh, discussions for AI augment the profit margins and our managed service offerings. Um, they're claiming they already initiated AI engagements with several customers to unlock the AI capabilities with customers they already have, which is another way that they can increase the profit margins on their existing base. So I do like that, and I do this makes sense to me. So it's an easier thing for them to do because it's customers they already have just that I need to make sure they can attract new customers through AI, either through the Microsoft channel or through themselves. I think I already talked about Microsoft relationship enough. It's critical to this investment thesis. If Microsoft ever said, no, you're no longer a, <laughs> a partner, then this would cripple the company. Obviously, it's a key risk. Here, they talked about the delays in pipeline conversion. But here, instead of just talking about it, they actually say what they're doing about it. So they already cut $4.5 in April, and then they removed the remaining to a total of $9.4 million at cost at the, at July, at the end of July the end of the reported quarter so this is exciting because they're actually doing something about the slowdown 9.4 million might seem small but um it's a decent amount for this company of this size like i said their free cash flow was only five million dollars for the first six months this year so there's a way to combat the slowdown that they're seeing in cloud they are um removing excess uh, production capacity which is what you want to see you want to see people actually making decisions when it's hard especially with these small companies if they don't they go out of business this is the earnout. Um, I don't think I talked about this yet, but in any calls, I usually don't see it too often. But earnouts are never well, they're not bad, they're not good. It depends. <laughs> so, uh, for earnouts, um, when you make an acquisition, sometimes you can um, pay out the management team over a specific amount of years, or whoever the seller is anyway, over a certain amount of years um, if they hit certain targets or milestones. Here's an example of that. Um, the only one that matters for our purposes now is the bank card acquisition. So they still have one $5 million cash payment to make and one $5 million in shares to make. Unfortunately, so when they made the deals, yeah, these all these acquisitions, you'll notice they're in 2021, which was the peak bubble for software. So they decided to make purchases during the peak bubble software. Now, luckily for them, they used, unfortunately, they used some cash, but they also used some shares, but their shares were still overpriced as well. And you can already overprice as well. So it's not a complete bad thing. But unfortunately for the earnouts, now that the share price is back down, it's actually more dilutive because they still have to issue more shares for the same dollar value. So that, that kind of sucks. It's uh, 5 million in shares, what I'm trying to say. Um, not a huge deal in the big scheme of things, but it's going to be more hair for the next two quarters. It's kind of cool to see different ways to play the AI boom that's not uh, directly linked to, say, the uh, say NVIDIA manufacturer or the, the cloud uh, quarterbacks. Though this one loosely is through Microsoft. So I, li I like that kind of play because I think it's more likely to happen. I thought this question was interesting. It's like, is it possible that the AI is somewhat freezing the market for the old, for the remain, the other cloud capa capabilities in the meantime? And maybe they're waiting to see what's around the corner on AI before they punch the ticket with you guys. They did say that application development where they referenced the re weakness in the quarter. They said there's delays about not only cost, but sometimes it's about thinking about how they want to incorporate AI as a component of these applications. Here I'm trying to think, I kind of view this paragraph as a gear shift. Right now in the quarter, it's just getting hit because their, their cloud business is stalling a bit and being delayed because people don't want to commit. And at the same time, they don't want to commit because they're thinking about they want to go into AI, which is another thing that Quisitive will be doing in the future. So it's more like a, a gear shift and it's showing up in the quarter. It really hurt them. Well, not really hurt them, but it was $5 million less in revenue on cloud side, which is small for the company. So what I'm trying to say here is I think it's just going to be like a hiccup. 
I thought that was an interesting paragraph. It's kind of how I view this investment over time. The main uncertainty is how quickly they can, and if they can, pivot to the AI push out with Azure on an co-pilot and just uh, make it work with Microsoft again like they already have been. Because if they can continue this trend, this revenue growth trend at this current valuation, and if EBITDA follows suit, it, it looks pretty good, right? So it, it's definitely an interesting time for this company. Um, and obviously the market right now is very unsure if uh, Acquisitive will be able to make the transition to supporting Microsoft and AI as much as it has been with the cloud computing in general. So, but based on what the call looks like, it sounds like they're able to. Anyway, I hope you thought that was interesting. It's kind of how I'm trying to think about AI as different plays that are linked to the winners, or the obvious winners anyway, over time. So anyway, that's Acquisitive, and have a great rest of your weekend.